Springs are coils of metal, and you can think of it as something like a slinky. And we're going to talk about the forces that such a spring can exert. When a, you set a spring on a table, it has a certain length to it. It wants to rest at a, a certain level of extension. And if you try to compress that spring, you'll notice that you have to exert a force. In other words, it takes effort for you to compress the spring beyond the natural length at which it would like to sit at when it was sitting on the table. And if that means, if you have to exert a force to compress it, that means that the spring is exerting a force back on your hand. So in the arrows here, if the green arrows represent the force that you exert with your hand to compress the spring, the red arrows pushing outward in this diagram represent the force arrows from the spring on your hand. At the same time, if you try to stretch the spring, in other words, pull it apart so that the green arrows now point away from the spring and you try to make the spring longer, you'll notice that the spring is push pulling back on you and it's difficult to pull it apart. So in other words, there's a red arrow of force from the spring back towards the center of the spring because it's trying to contract. No matter what, the spring seems to want to go back to its so-called rest length, the length that it would be at if you had let go and set it on the table. Such a force is called a restoring force because in whatever direction you are pushing or pulling, the spring wants to go back to its origin, which was the rest length it would be at. And it actually switches direction depending on whether or not you are pulling it apart or compressing it together. Robert Hooke long ago developed uh, what's called Hooke's Law to describe a spring force. Actually, another sort of important feature about a spring is that if you were to pull at the spring a little bit, it pulls back on you with a small amount of force. But if you don't pull at all, of course, there's no force. If you pull the spring even further apart, so it's twice as long, then you have to, you'll find that you have to exert twice as much force to get it to be twice as long as it was before. And in fact, uh, if we define a coordinate for this distance that you are pulling the spring, where uh, x is a variable that is zero when the spring is at its rest length, in other words, uh, it sort of defines the zero of the coordinate system and it's the end of the spring, and x is positive means that you're trying to stretch the spring out by some amount, x is negative means you're trying to compress it by some amount. Hooke's law describes the the relationship between the amount of force that you have to pull with and the amount of force that the or the amount the amount of distance that you're trying to compress or or stretch the spring. Hooke's law states that the force of the spring back exerted back on you will be minus k times this uh, quantity x. And notice that we're putting arrows over both the force and the the direction x because these are vectors x is positive means it's, that you're trying to stretch the spring. x is negative means you're trying to compress the spring. And this force in Hooke's law is the force that the spring is exerting back on your hand. So if you are pulling down by this amount f down in this picture on the red ball, then this, this quantity f spring is the amount by which the spring is pulling back on you. Notice that in this case, x is positive. It's, a, it's an amount by which you are stretching the spring, but the, the spring force is negative. It's pointing back in the opposite direction because the spring is pulling back on your hand. The quantity k is called the spring constant. It appears as a constant of proportionality between x and the force and is, has units of newtons per meter. It's a property of the spring itself. Let's take a look at Hooke's Law in a little bit greater detail. In the center, we imagine a spring at its rest length, and so this quantity x is valued 0. If we pull the, the spring outward a certain distance till its point location a, then x is positive and force is negative, in other words, it's pointing, the force of the spring is negative, in other words, it's pointing back toward the center of the spring. If we try compressing the spring to the location B here, then X is negative, but the force is positive from the spring, in other words, it's trying to compress back outward toward the origin. The force of the spring always points in the opposite direction, as does X.
we also should remember what this constant of proportionality is. It's a property of the spring, and it dictates how much you'll have to force you'll have to extend or uh, to exert to, in order to extend or compress the spring. If k is small, it's something like you have a wimpy slinky, and it doesn't take much effort to compress or extend the spring. But if k is large, then it takes a lot of force, and you have a, a substantially stronger spring. So let's imagine what this graph looks like, where force will be the quantity that's applied on the vertical axis. That's the force of the spring. And x is the amount that you're trying to compress or extend the spring. So this green line graphs Hooke's law. In other words, if we're at location A right here, and x is a positive quantity, so x sub A, then the force is a negative quantity because it's pointing back toward the origin. On the other hand, if you have tried to compress the spring and you're at location B, then x sub B is a negative quantity. Notice it's to the left of the horizontal, uh, the origin here on the horizontal axis. And force at this location, force of the spring, is positive. It's trying to point back toward the origin. In other words, put, uh, extend the spring back out again. The green line indicates the, uh, for, uh, the force curve for a spring with a relatively large k value, or a spring constant. Here's a red line, uh, which would indicate the graph for Hooke's law for a spring that has a relatively small k value. Now springs, as we've graphed them here, this is a somewhat idealized case. In fact, the real curve for a spring has a somewhat linear region, just like we've drawn here in this picture. But then if we keep pulling out, we notice that this, what would really happen with a real piece of metal is we approach something called the yield strength, when it's in fact case that the spring wouldn't go back to its original case. We've distorted the metal. And at a certain point, there's a point where the, the spring would actually fracture. We would, be, we would be yanking it in half. And that's when you try to extend it out too far. But there is this linear region here of this graph where force and distance or extension is, are linear related. That's sometimes called the elastic region for a spring. And it's where the springy object obeys Hooke's law. The, the relationship between the force exerted by the spring and the amount of extension or compression is linear.